Welcome back to the History of the Papacy podcast, a podcast about the Popes of Rome and Christian Church. Prepare yourself to step behind the ropes and leave the official tour of the story of the Popes and Christianity. I am your host, Steve Guerra, and I thank you for joining me on this journey. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Matthew 4.23-4.25 to In this series and in this podcast in general, there's lots of talk about the Temple of Jerusalem. The Temple, of course, was of extreme importance. It was the center of the universe for Second Temple Jews. The Second Temple was Second Temple Judaism. But if one didn't live around Jerusalem, maybe they only visited the temple once a year or even once or twice in a lifetime, if ever. The temple was the place where the sacrifice to God occurred. There is no doubt about that. It's where the high priests taught and argued, but mostly amongst their own rank. Where did the regular Second Temple Jew engage with his religion? You know, the person who lived in the hinterlands of Judea, or even in the far-flung Second Temple Jewish diaspora. We're talking about people who lived as far away as Rome, or even in the opposite direction to Babylon, all over the place. These people went to the local religious meeting hall. That was the place, the synagogue. In this episode, we'll ask some questions and try and figure out a few things. We'll try and figure out what was the basic function of the synagogue? What's the history of the synagogue, the basic layout, and how that layout changed? What did Christ have to do with the synagogue? How did the synagogue system differ from the temple? But then how did the two institutions collapse into each other? How did the synagogue play into the development of Christianity and rabbinical Judaism, two offshoots of Second Temple Judaism. After listening to the episode, reach out to me and let me know what you think about all of these questions and what thoughts and ideas you have, or put your thoughts in the description or however you want to reach out. Let's start with what is a synagogue. In short, a synagogue's a building, but like churches, The synagogue represents much, much more. The synagogue is an institution to this very day, a place of gathering, learning, and praying. It sounds a lot like what goes on in a church traditionally all the way up to today, right? What's missing, though? The sacrifice is the missing component. In the Second Temple Jewish period, sacrifices to God were done at the Temple of Jerusalem. In earlier times, sacrifices were done in different places. Second Temple Jewish sacrificial theology and practice is a huge topic. We might get into it, especially if you're interested, but we might also save that for a different series. In this series, we'll likely have an episode that touches on the Second Temple and then the First Temple, but look for a deep dive maybe at some point in the future. Here's the very basic story of the Second Temple, though. Sacrifice as an idea is offering up some object to a divinity. Anthropologically, it's almost always associated with food or a ritual meal. In the Second Temple Jewish context, a variety of animals were sacrificed for different reasons, depending on the time and occasion. 
An example of this sacrifice is the sacrifice of the lamb at Pesach or Pascha, the Passover. The Old Testament describes grain and wine offerings as well. Other ancient religions had similar and vastly different practices. Neighboring groups in earlier times, and in some cases contemporarily, sacrificed humans, in particular children, to their gods. For Christians, the sacrifice moved away from animals to that of Christ Jesus. Christian belief in Christian belief in whether that sacrifice performed after Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, if that's an actual sacrifice being done at the liturgy or at the Mass, or is symbolic, is a debate that basically raged from the first century AD all the way up to the present day. We'll get into more of this idea of the Christian idea of sacrifice in a little bit. The synagogue was the place really the building where Second Temple Jews would go weekly on the Sabbath day to hear the sacred scriptures read and then hear a teaching lesson associated with that reading. That was the basic or essential function of the synagogue, but there is much, much more. It was a local meeting place for the town as well. It could also be a local meeting place for an association, a club, or a guild. The synagogue was where the religious teaching occurred primarily, and it was a place for people to assemble and meet. Let's talk a little bit more about what the synagogue was. It comes from the word soon agoge, Greek for place of meeting. Greek soon together, agayan, bring together, literally bringing together. Synagogue wasn't the only name for non-temple places of assembly, though. Sometimes it was referred to as the Bet Knesset, Hebrew for house of gathering, or Bet Amma, which was Aramaic for house of the people. Now, some texts use this term prosuche. I'm not exactly sure if that's how it's pronounced, but we'll go with that. That is Greek for place of prayer. It's usually referred to in specific circumstances. It's referred to this system or building in an era pre-synagogue in in terms of earlier than the use of the word synagogue was used. And it was especially used in Egypt. Prosucha and synagogue sometimes were used interchangeably as well, but really the two institutions had different functions. Prosuche, literally place of prayer, the place where people prayed and offered minor sacrifices. And the earliest records go back to the 3rd and 4th centuries BCE. It's a critical time and place. It's a critical time because It's pre-Maccabean revolt, and more importantly, what we probably should refer to as the Maccabean Reformation. It's critical place. Egyptian Judaism had many distinct practices from Judean Judaism. We're talking about a different time and a different place. Steve here. We are a member of the Parthenon Podcast Network, featuring great shows like James Early's Key Battles of American History podcast and many other great shows. Go over to ParthenonPodcast.com to learn more. And here is a quick word from our sponsors. Now let's move forward a little bit into a very different time in a different place. The synagogue of the first century A.D. Judea resembled the Egyptian prosuka of maybe a few hundred years ago, but with some significant differences as well. The synagogue was specifically not a place of prayer. Look at the New Testament, which is one of our best sources, actually, of how a Second Temple Jewish synagogue worked. Let's look at the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, quote, 
And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Jesus compares praying in the synagogue to praying out in the middle of the street. He's saying it's a kind of showboating. You should pray in your own house or in the temple. When Jesus refers to prayer, it is either in the temple, for example, the publican and the Pharisee, or it's an independent act, such as when Jesus himself prays in the Garden of Gethsemane. Both the prosuke and the synagogue show or don't show something interesting. Both terms demonstrate prayer and meeting, but not sacrifice. And they also show a differentiation between prayer and sacrifice. Prosuke, place of prayer, and synagogue, place of meeting, were used synonymously by Philo of Alexandria and Josephus. Their time and place is interesting because they're a little bit later. They're both living in the first century AD. But both the prosuke and the synagogue had similar but differing functions. Josephus even at times refers to these meetings halls as just topos or simply places or buildings. So we see by the time of Josephus, all of these terms are getting intermingled. Now let's talk about the Bible. Where is it mentioned in the Bible to construct these synagogues or meeting places? Go quickly, go flip through your Bible and find it for me. I'll wait a second. Okay. In short, this institution of a synagogue is not mentioned at all, at least not in the Old Testament, but there's many references to it in the New Testament. That's important. But first, the building of the tabernacle or the mobile temple is described in deep blueprint level details. When the Israelites settled, they used the blueprints of the tabernacle to build their own temples. And I said temples in the plural because there was certainly more than one. Again, we'll probably describe that in a, and discuss that in a later episode. By the time the New Testament comes around, the New Testament was largely written in the late first century, or at least that was when it was published, so to speak, but it was reflecting things that happened in the early first century. But it just, the New Testament describes the synagogue in great detail as an institution. They never mention this word prosuke, and they don't refer to the synagogue ever as a place a house of prayer in that sense, but purely the synagogue as a place of meeting and teaching. It's interesting because synagogues will take on prayer functions again in the times after the destruction of the second temple. What did a synagogue look like? There's a decent amount of archaeology of more modern post-destruction Second Temple synagogues, but a lot less evidence from pre-Second Temple destruction times. We have one really good example of in the town of Capernaum, where the post-Second Temple synagogue actually sits on the foundations of the first of a pre-destruction of the Second Temple synagogue, they're made out of different materials at a very basic level and have slightly different, and they do have different layouts as well. But here's our pre-destruction evidence. This building had a true meeting space design. They were roughly rectangular buildings with a large central, large open central space surrounded by seating on three sides. The seating was built in benches that ran around the edge of the walls, and there were three or four tiers of seating. There was an apse of some sort at the opposite side of the seating. It's a little hard to visualize, but there's plenty of images available online. The tiers of seatings on the three sides and an apse or a niche 
on one end and an open floor plan in the middle. That's the really basic design. Then there was usually large columns to hold up the roof. The large columns broke up the view from the benches, though, so you can't say that one of these early synagogues had great seating. Every seat was a great view. That was not the case. There was some pretty bad seating. But it's pretty clear to scholars that this building had a pers- really specific purpose for this space and floor plan. It was meant for an audience to watch someone speak. Since the space wasn't huge, probably just one person spoke, and, and they probably likely didn't have debates, and very likely this was not a specifically designed space for performances. There's nothing to say that this space wasn't used for many other purposes, though, at different times. It just wasn't documented, and it wasn't the primary use of the space. It kind of think of like a um, hockey stadium. A hockey stadium is specifically designed to play hockey on it. It has the ice in the middle. That's not to say that the a stadium, a hockey stadium isn't used for other purposes. They have concerts there. They have the the rodeo sometimes. They have a circus, but they have to modify the layout of the hockey stadium, cover the ice, etc., to make the space work for those other purposes. This synagogue was a place of meeting, but specifically religious meeting. They'd read some Torah and then have a lecture. Sometimes scholars think that ordinarily it might have been one specific person who was the lecturer, but they would often enough have a guest lecturer such as Jesus. This was usually held on the Sabbath day, but again, not always. It also served as a sort of community center featuring other great activities like vloggings and other kinds of meetings. And again, this makes sense. Most buildings in any time period would have been multi-use or multi-purpose. It just doesn't make sense to invest so much in a place and then not use it beyond once or twice a week. Now let's get into the post-destruction of the Second Temple evidence. Synagogues from after the destruction of the temple look different than the pre-destruction. Many synagogues are much larger. They're also more elaborately adorned. The floor plan has changed as well. They start to look something much closer to a basilica either a Roman basilica or a basilica church design. You have two rows of columns that define a central space with room on both either sides of this colonnade. And then you have an apse at the end, which in the synagogue case held the Torah scrolls. This is the design prototype all the way to the present day. As always, there is a, a certain amount of evolution in local differences. This this basilica layout just makes a lot of sense for meeting it. If you're in the middle, you have a great seat to what's going on in the apse or the front. And even if you're at the sides, the sides can be a place where you have little side meetings or it's an overflow space where you might not have the greatest view of what's going on in the front and middle, but it's not terrible. In the first centuries B.C. and A.D. in the Levant, synagogues are found in Judea, then there's a sort of dead zone in Samaria to the north, and then a bunch more synagogues again in the Galilee, which is north of Samaria. And this indicates that synagogues, at least in this earliest period, were a Judean institution. The dearths of synagogues in Samaria is another example to show that the institution of the synagogue was not ancient. If the synagogue was a part of the ancient Hebrew Israelite religion, say pre-Babylonian exile, then there should be much more older representations in Samaria. The Samaritans do appear to have adopted the institution in later times, though. Evidence of a Samaritan synagogue from the 500s found in Bet She'an is an example of this, which was in the area of Samaria. 
To learn more about Samaria and the Samaritans, go back to our episode on the Samaritans. Oh, wait, do you have a moment? A great way to support the History of the Papacy podcast is by joining us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash history of the papacy. Your support on Patreon goes such a long way to help keep the history of the papacy sustainable and on the air for a long time in the future. There are four tiers of support on Patreon, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. Each of these tiers represents one of the traditional patriarchates of early Christianity. There are many great benefits to you for supporting the show on Patreon. You will receive early and advertisement-free content, bonus episodes, monthly book drawings, and most importantly, you will be included on the History of the Papacy diptychs. In traditional Christianity, the diptychs are the lists of bishops commemorated in the order of their precedence. The sooner you sign up on Patreon, the higher you will be on the lists of the History of the Papacy patrons. Now, here's a brief message from our sponsors. Let's zoom out a little bit to outside of the Levant. Synagogues were found all over the place in the Roman Empire. Philo of Alexandria clearly says there are many in Alexandria, also in Rome and in Asia Minor. Josephus describes synagogues in Damascus. Pretty much anywhere where there was a Jewish diaspora community, there were synagogues. There was the famous Dura Europa synagogue all the way out in the desert of Syria. Moving on post-Second Jewish Temple destruction, what is a Second Temple Jew to do after the destruction of the Second Temple? Don't forget, there's all these synagogues, but the central focus of the religion was at the Second Temple. So what did they do with their religious lives? The, The real quick and easy answer was it wasn't easy. We begin now the slow process of the development of rabbinical Judaism. Teaching and the extensive study of the Torah became the central part of their religion. The synagogue is the perfect place for study and lecture. In the Yiddish language, synagogues are referred to as shuls or schools. Now, what happened in the Christian context, something that's more important for the development of Christianity and the Church of Rome, what did they do with the synagogue? There is a stream of thought that says Christian worship developed out of the synagogue. This is particularly prominent in the Protestant world. What they would say is Christians formed communities that prayed together heard some sacred literature, and then got essentially what was a sermon. If you go back and listen to the episodes we did with Professor Andrew Mesmer, we discussed a new idea that's bubbling up in the academy that says Christian liturgy grew out of the Greco-Roman symposium dinner party format. People gathered in the evening, ate a meal, and then heard a reading and had a discussion on a sacred text, which is similar in a way to the to the synagogue idea. But then you lose in the synagogue the sacrificial nature of early Christianity. Now, there's a more traditional view in the scholarship and also amongst the more sacramental churches in that the Christian liturgy grew out of Second Temple Jewish liturgy. All of this is in broad strokes, of course, and there's a, what they would say is that there's a real close overlap and that the if you look at it and think about it, I've laid out all of these positions in really broad strokes, of course. There's a great deal of crossover, nuance, and hair splitting between all of these theories and more. They can all work in a house church setting as well. It's not, if you want to think about it, that these are earliest Christians generally met in house congregations or what Gary Stevens of the History and the Bible often refers to them as as Jesus clubs. Any of these ideas really can work in this house church setting. But what was a house church and how maybe would that have jived with these ideas that we're talking about of the synagogue? 
We have to ask our questions. Was this house church the sort of thing where the owner of the house moved the proverbial sofa and coffee table over so that the people could meet in his living room as Christians? Was the house church a home where all or part of the house was dedicated to Christian worship? Again, this isn't black or white, but from my reading, the general idea was that a house church was a private domicile that was repurposed as a set-aside Christian worship space. The Dura Europas House Church is an example of this. Also, the standard Roman villa layout really lent itself well to meetings. There was defined public and private spaces. Most houses, at least in the United States, are not designed in this way. The entire house is really, by definition, a private space, even the living room. It has the TV. It's uh, probably in most houses, it's where you're going to relax in the evening. You will, if you're having company over, you're going to hang out in the living room or you may hang out in the kitchen. You may hang out in any number of rooms. The bedrooms are generally the super private spaces. But once you're inviting somebody into your home, it's not like having them in your office that it's clearly a public space. Houses that have in businesses in them are an example of a clearly defined public and private spaces. And I'm thinking in the post-COVID uh, homework scenarios, it's really common for people to have a dedicated home office that is very specifically dedicated to work, and it's not used in domestic purposes. It's not likely a place where Somebody's going to, after their work time, go back in there to, say, play computer games or to just hang out sort of thing. People have separated that work, public workspace, and then their private home. For much of the time before Constantine, it wasn't easy for Christians to operate in public. They couldn't build task-specific buildings. Some Christians also would have continued to use the local synagogue. So here's my thoughts and speculations on the synagogue and Christianity. Take it or leave it or leave your ideas in the comments or send me your thoughts to Steve at A2Z History page or on the Facebook post for this episode or Facebook message. And my opinion and my thought is that speculation is that the synagogue and temple worship collapsed into one building, the church, not the uppercase church as in the institution, but in the lowercase church building sense. The functions of prayer, liturgical sacrifice, teaching and lecture combined in all together to make something new. This is maybe one of the innovations that allowed Christianity to flourish. Look at the Catholic or Orthodox Mass or Divine Liturgy or basically any Christian denomination that, act, that uses the sacrifice or includes the sacrifice as a regular part of their worship. In their liturgy, they include teaching and sacrificial portions. There are readings of sacred texts and then a lecture on those texts, the sermon. Then there is the sacrificial portion that ends with the sacrifice of communion. The temple was for prayer, worship, and sacrifice. The synagogue was for teaching and learning. After the destruction of the second temple in 70 AD, there was no temple to conduct sacrifices anymore. And frankly, Christian sacrifice was different from the sacrifice conducted at the temple. The early Christians and even the gospel speak of this. The Christians were conducting their sacrifices and worshiping differently than other Second Temple Jews decades before the destruction of the temple. In a way, the Christians were ready for the destruction. The Christians then adopted another Roman innovation, the Basilica. The Basilica building is almost tailor-made for the practices of the Christians. It was flexible enough to have sacred spaces for the sacrifice, teaching places, and public places. The functions of the temple and the synagogue could easily be held under one roof. 
Now, with rabbinical Judaism, it took a long time for rabbinical Judaism to come out of this. And then they pretty much abandoned the idea of sacrifice, but they continued to do teaching and learning. So the synagogue was the perfect place to have all of that under one house. The temple is gone. The temple is a place that has to be rebuilt in order to conduct the sacrifice. So let's separate them and have them as two separate things. At least that's my speculation. If if you have other ideas, thoughts, or questions, or your own speculations, send me an email, reach out on Facebook, on either the page or the A2Z history page on Facebook group on Facebook. Also consider becoming a member on Patreon. We have a group growing there and a lot of conversations. So thank you for joining me and I will talk to you next time. Hey, before we go, let us commemorate the Patreon patrons on the history of the papacy diptychs. We have at the Alexandria level, Roberto, William B., Brian, Christina, Augustus, Judy, and Max. At the Constantinople, we have Dapo, Paul, Justin, Lana, John, Steve, and Sean, all of whom are magnificent and reaching that ultimate power and prestige, that of the Sea of Rome. We have Peter the Great, Amma the Great, Jeffrey the Great, Frederick the Great, and Jim the Great. With that, I hope you enjoy this next piece of the mosaic of the history of the Popes of Rome and Christian Church. Oh.